Hi, I just want to welcome you all to My Horse University's web presentation series, and we are featuring Dr. Brian Nielsen from Michigan State University tonight. He will be discussing conditioning your horse for the show season. Dr. Nielsen studied animal science with an equine emphasis at the University of Wisconsin River Falls and then performed his graduate work at Texas A&M University in the area of equine nutrition and exercise. His MS research which involved feeding um, of silicon to young racehorses to prevent injury. He won the nutrition paper competition at the 13th Equine Nutrition Symposium. He also has received his PhD. He began working at Michigan State in the Department of Animal Science where he currently is employed as an associate professor with 40% teaching and 60% research. He's an active member of the American Society of Animal Science as well as other associations as well. Let's all welcome him and we will be just a little bit of logistics. I am going to let you know that um, we can take questions throughout the presentation. Let's just make sure that they're pertaining to the slides that Dr. Nielsen is going over. And we will also do a Q&A at the end as well. Um, I also wanted to let you know that uh, My Horse University just launched um, four different short courses, um, which you can um, find out more information on our website at www.myhorseuniversity.com. And we just all want to thank you, and um, we'll turn it over to Dr. Nielsen. Thank you with that. I think I'm live here, and uh, I, I want to thank you for that introduction, and, and it took long enough that we're out of time. We'll see you all later. Uh, just teasing folks. Uh, glad you could be here tonight. Uh, I, I think we're going to have some fun. It was kind of neat getting to see where everybody uh, was from across the U.S. We have a lot of variety there. We also have a lot of variety in what people are interested in for the various disciplines. And that's actually going to make it a little bit tricky for uh, the uh, I'm just looking at this, making certain that people can hear stuff. Okay, looks like we can. Um, what is tricky is when you're talking about conditioning your horse for the show season, there are so many different disciplines that it's hard to give a lot of specifics. For instance, those people that are riding dressage may be doing things a little bit different than those that do Western Pleasure, and that's going to be different than the people that are going ahead and competing with eventers. So what we're going to try and do is give you some some broad general concepts that you'll be able to use in your program and things that we're going to start out we're going to talk about some various goals some of these goals are going to be pretty obvious and then we'll have another one that if you've been in the horse game long enough you'll realize it's an obvious one too uh, and then various considerations that you need to have when planning how you're going to condition uh, your horses then we're going to talk about various workloads, what intensity and durations you need to be considering. And then not only the physical part about training your horses, but also the mental aspect of it. We're going to talk uh, a little bit about some things that hopefully you'll find very interesting regarding some things that make horses just phenomenal athletes and also how we monitor these. And, and then we'll kind of wrap things up with determining whether or not you've actually met your goals. So with that, let's talk about your goals. And, and I think for most people, the first training goal is pretty obvious. You want to increase your performance, whether it's an athletic course and, you know, you're wanting to, uh, you know, get to the winner circle or whether it's your show horse you're wanting more blue ribbons, more trophies. Obviously, we want to do better. And in fact, sometimes it isn't even a case of needing to win but just a case of improving your performance from previous. Now, again, that one's a pretty obvious one. The other one that should be important, and a lot of horse people recognize it after being in it for a long time, but you definitely need to put it up to the forefront of your thought, is trying to decrease injuries. That can be one of the things that can either make you or break you. Uh, again, horses are absolutely phenomenal athletes, but when they're injured, they're not going to perform up to the level that they should. Two points I want to make on this uh, as to what the injury factor can play. I was talking with one of my students today after class. She mentioned that she had a, a horse. It was a, a warm blood imported from Germany. And when they brought it, wonderful horse, uh, definitely going to be one that they would be able to compete. She's thinking even going to the pre-St. George level. As it turns out, this horse's attitude has changed. Uh, the horse is kind of 
actually become quite uh, ill-mannered. Uh, she used another word. I won't use it here. Uh, you can imagine what that might be. Uh, and trying to figure out what it probably is, well, there's some thoughts. The mirror, when uh, previously dealing with her, had been pregnant, and of course that uh, tempers the hormonal issues. But these changes were dramatic enough that probably what this horse is experiencing is some type of soreness. In other words, rider getting on the horse's back, the horse being sore, and so many times that can greatly uh, affect a horse's mental attitude. And if they're not happy with what they're doing, then they're not going to be performing well. Now, along with that, I also want to propose another thing right here at this point, just because I think it's an important enough issue to bring up, is riding horses that have some unsoundness. You know, it's done a lot. And in fact, I often have students come up to me and ask, so Brian, you know, I have this horse, she's a little sore on the front, is it okay if I ride her? And I just kind of pose this question to them, well, that soreness probably indicates that your horse is in pain. And if you ride your horse more, you're going to cause it more pain. If you're comfortable doing that horse, by all means, go ahead and ride it. Okay, you're thinking about that a little bit. And it's one of those things that I wish more people would give consideration to. Um, yeah, probably your choice, if you think about it in that term, is no, you're probably not going to ride it because that horse is experiencing pain and, and hopefully you like your horse enough where you don't want to cause it more pain. So anyway, between uh, increasing your performance, decreasing injuries, these are probably two of our primary things that we want to keep in mind. But then you're asking, so how do we do these? Well, first of all, when devising your training program, it does help to be organized. You need to give some thought as to uh, what you want to accomplish and how long it's going to take. For some individuals, that planning may need to start very early. You know, we got a picture of a uh, scrawny old broodmare and a baby here, and is it too young to start thinking about it when that baby is just born? Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, and in fact, sometimes we need to start planning even before then. In other words, when we're planning what matings we're going to use. So again, for a lot of folks, that might be way too early to start thinking about things. Uh, for other folks, you know, you're buying a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old. It's going to depend what you want to do with your animal, how much time it's going to take. But I'm also going to come back to this towards the end when we're talking about planning and show dates and targeting uh, getting your horse ready by a certain date and some concerns that you need to have with it. But truthfully, you really need to be organized in that it's a great idea to allow yourself a lot of extra time. Where probably a lot of people make the most mistakes is by going ahead and trying to rush things because you think, ah, oh, I can have my horse ready in three months. But you always get these little roadblocks that go along with it that cause some problems for you. And if you haven't allotted extra time, the likelihood is you're going to create some issues for you and your horse. The other reason why planning early, potentially even before you have a baby, is important is when you're considering what type of event you're going to use your horse for, sometimes that breeding is extremely, extremely important. Um, and there's a saying that in order to be a great athlete, the most important thing you're going to do or in other words, to be a, a, a great athlete, the most important choice you can make is who your parents are. Well, and by that we're meaning you need to have the right bloodlines. And this is important for all types of athletes, you know, show horses included. It is extremely difficult for a horse to p compete at the top level if it isn't bred for it. Now, is it possible to pay, uh, compete successfully at a local level and have some fun with your horse even if it doesn't have the appropriate breeding? Absolutely. Absolutely. But you have to uh, temper your goals with, um, you know, what are you shooting for? And if you want to go for the, the top level, it is important to to have the appropriate breeding. So, for instance, you're not going to have a, a quarter horse halter horse that you're going to typically use in barrel racing. Uh, two different totally types of animals. They're both quarter horses, but the, uh, the barrel racing horse typically is going to be an individual that often has some race bloodlines, whereas the halter horse is uh, going to have the bloodlines more specific to that. Again, if you want to be at your top level. The other thing you need in your training program is to be progressive, always staying 
uh, at the same level is probably not going to get you anywhere. Uh, there's a, a saying you're probably familiar with, which is no pain, no pain. Oops, I'm sorry, that's the, the, the saying I like. <laughs> no pain, no pain. Actually, it's no pain, no gain. Now, I'm not saying you want to make your horses uh, experience pain, but you need to go ahead and improve or increase your intensity, your duration, so that your animal can move to a higher level. Again, a lot of these are pretty obvious, but they're things that you definitely need to keep in mind as you're devising your training program. Another thing, let's keep it interesting. Picture yourself. You're a show horse. You uh, live your day 23 hours in a stall. I like to consider a stall to be pretty much a, a, a GL cell. If you think about it, it's a 12 by 12 uh, room, and you, probably your horses don't even have cable TV in there. A lot of your prisoners might even have more than that. So they can get pretty bored in those 23 hours when they're sitting in a stall, if that's uh, the life that they have. Um, well, then what's, what do they get during their hour outside? Well, they uh, might go around a ring for an hour, walk trot, slow lope, have somebody, you know, pulling on you, kicking you, spurring you, whatever. That's not that exciting. Uh, I think most of us would get pretty bored if we have the same routine over and over again. So we're going to talk about some of the other things you can do to spice your horse's life up a little bit with your training program. But remember, you always, you know, people are, are critical if you try to put, you know, human emotions into your animals. They probably don't have the exact same ones. But I also think we make a mistake if we don't put our, ourselves in the horse's shoes. Please don't nail them to the bottom of my feet. Um, but if we don't put our, our, uh, our, our feet in their shoes sometime and think about what life they're experiencing. And really, to try and make things interesting, changing things up, is probably going to help you have an, a, a more enthusiastic horse, a horse that is quote unquote happier about what it's doing and it's probably going to be performing at a higher level. So if you can not keep those things in mind, we can start talking about, well, the other factors. So let's talk about that workload, that intensity. Now one of the things that you need to consider is uh, speed and strength are kind of inversely related to endurance. So in other words, you can't have an animal that is extremely strong and extremely fast, has explosive power, and can keep it up for immensely long periods of time. It doesn't work that way. So you, we tend to train, uh, and this would apply you know, for human athletes as well as horses, um, you, know, you, you uh, need to temper the intensity of it with how long you're going to be doing it. Uh, to ask a horse to compete at a very high level for an extremely long period of time is going to increase the likelihood of injuries. But at the same point, we need to increase the intensity that we have with these horses. So if we always go around the ring and we're doing a walk, a trot, not doing anything more than that, we're not actually going to build up much much strength, much speed. Most events or a lot of events that we compete in don't need that, but at the same point it can improve your performance. There's a, a point you need to think about too regarding strength. In order to maintain the, uh, the frame that we like to have our horses in sometimes, it does require some strength, also oftentimes requires some uh, endurance. And that's a, a thing that we often neglect. Um, we can build our horses up so they can go extremely long distance. There's endurance rides out there where you know, you're covering a hundred or more miles with your horse, so they certainly can do it. But like with a human athlete, you know, you can run a marathon, a lot of folks do, um, but you don't go ahead and, and start training for a marathon by running 26 miles. What you end up doing is you start at a very low level and increasing it. And if you're doing it gradually, that's going to allow that the body to adapt um, and to be able to do it relatively effortlessly. Um, and so are horses. You're thinking, well, I, I'm not planning to do an endurance ride. I'm just going into a class. You know, um, let's say you have a, a pleasure horse. And how long does your average class last? Well, maybe a few minutes, 
arguably could last a lot longer than that, and especially if you move into some larger classes. The reason why having a horse have some endurance capabilities is important is if you get stuck in one of those classes and it's going longer and your horse is getting fatigued, it's probably going to change that horse's attitude. It won't be able to maintain its frame. That's going to frustrate you. You pick on your horse and it's just a, a very negative situation that uh, evolves. So it is important to develop some, uh, some endurance for these animals and again keeping in mind what you're planning to do with them. Now I'll tell you what would be a bad mistake is trying to take a horse, for instance a barrel horse, one that has to uh, just compete at a, a very high intensity for a short period of time and training it like you would an endurance athlete. You would, get, you would actually lose some of your benefits from training. Um, Horses, as we'll talk about in a little bit, have muscles that are developed for doing high intensity exercise. Um, and, and as a result, they are very capable of going very fast for very short periods of time. Most of the training that we do with them actually allows that horse to have more endurance to sustain its level of activity. Um, and so if you took this barrel horse, one that needed to go out there and just run for a few seconds, and started riding it for an hour or two at a pretty uh, strong trot, what you're actually going to probably end up doing is slowing that horse down when you're coming to competition. You might do wonderful things for the mind, and, and that mental part is an absolutely critical part of success, but you might actually slow it down. So it's really important you decide uh, what type of activity are you doing, and along with that, um, do you need to be emphasizing some intensity? If you've got a show jumper, you need to have this horse very strong. Um, if it's a Western Pleasure horse, that isn't as critical. For both of them, some endurance might be uh, helpful. And I've emphasized this before, which is do not forget the mental aspect of training. Horses are phenomenal athletes. They can handle a lot of that stuff without much input from us. Where we can mess the horse up so quickly is the mental aspect of it. And, you know, I'll go back to this barrel horse situation. How many of you, <laughs> looking for hands here, I can't see them, but I'm looking for hands, have gone to a speed show and seen a horse that you would just never put anybody that you loved on this animal because it's rearing, it's charging, and you have somebody that has their little kid on it. And I just don't get that type of deal. The problem is, is we've created a mental issue for the horse. The horse is not enjoying that type of activity. We need to change things up. Um, you know, people often think that a horse that runs off with you, well, that's a horse that likes to go fast. Well, this is coming from a guy who's done a whole lot of work in the racing industry. More times than not, a horse that's running off with you is not happy. It's uh, a horse that may be a sore, and believe it or not, a sore horse will try and run off with you because they're in pain and they're trying to get away from it, or they've uh, gone a little bit speed crazy. The absolute best horses I've ever broken galloped, you would consider if you watched them, to be lazy. Uh, I had a mare that I broke that she ended up winning over $700,000. Um, she sold for a half a million dollars later on and uh, when I had a, a friend gallop her with me she couldn't get her to break out of a trot. This is before the mare had ever raced. You know, It's a great example of speed crazy idiotic horses don't necessarily enjoy their job but ones that are happy and enjoying it are probably going to perform a lot better. So that mental aspect, again, emphasizing it, and we'll talk a little bit later on about different ways to help create a happy horse. So time to move into, you're actually training, you're conditioning horses, and what we all would love to have is some way to monitor them. You know, look at the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, muscular, skeletal system, different ways to determine whether or not we're achieving fitness. And I wish it was really simple, but it's probably not as, as nice as what we would like. 
but I'll give you some thoughts on this anyway. One of the things that people can use is you can monitor heart rate if you're looking at the cardiovascular system. And looking at the heart rate can tell you some clues. In order to do it, one of the things that really aids is having a, a, a heart rate monitor. And uh, these things are actually not all, ex all that expensive these days. You can probably buy one for 100, 200 bucks, somewhere in that range that can provide you some useful information. And the advantage of having a heart rate monitor on your animal is while you're riding it, you can see what the heart is doing. So let's give you a little bit of an idea where that could be useful. Resting heart rate on a horse probably anywhere in the 28 to 35 beats per minute range. Now if you go in there and you start poking and prodding your horse trying to take its pulse, um, a lot of horses if they haven't had that uh, done to them before or if they're a horse that's a little bit high strung, most likely it's probably going to be higher than that. But if you're taking a resting heart rate on your horse and it's much higher than at 40 beats per minute, you need to start considering whether there's something wrong, whether your horse is a little bit sick, a little bit sore, because those are clues that that horse can um, probably not be at its best. And if that's the case, you need to do your horse a favor and give it some time off. Um, but again, a high-strung horse, or if you're not really good at taking heart rates, you might find it elevated. If you come back and do it again, it might drop down. As for exercise, <clears throat> we have two types of exercise that we, we tend to fit uh, or, or we tend to categorize animals working at. Either aerobic exercise, and when we're speaking aerobic, that indicates exercise that's done where the horse is able to take in enough oxygen to meet the demands of the muscles and all the other tissues of the body. Typically, that's under 150 beats per minute. When we're getting over 150 beats per minute, that's when we're doing anaerobic exercise, and that's when that animal is not able to take in enough oxygen to meet its demands. And once we start to uh, compete anaerobically or have our horse perform anaerobically, kind of like with humans, you're going to have to slow down at some point. You can do it for a few minutes, but then at some point you have to stop to catch your breath. So even if you don't have a heart rate monitor on your horse, one of the things that can tell you if you're working your an animal anaerobically is when you stop the exercise, whether they're sitting there huffing and puffing trying to catch their breath. If they're not, then you're probably just working them aerobically. That's fine. It helps to build up endurance. But it's not going to provide you a lot of benefit when it comes to intensity because it's not that intense of work. There's other ways that we can use heart rates. Um, first of all, if you have a heart rate monitor on your animal, and if you're noticing an increase in heart rate during exercise, in other words, you're working at a steady state, and all of a sudden you've noticed the heart rate start to increase, that's a pretty good sign that your horse is fatiguing, time to slow down, otherwise you increase the likelihood of it experiencing injury. We can look at uh, recovery heart rate. The more fit an animal is, the quicker its heart rate would go down to resting values. You don't even need a heart rate for this. You can go ahead and, and measure it. Um, it might be kind of difficult immediately after exercise, but if you're measuring your horse's heart rate five minutes after exercise, it'll be down at a countable range. And you can compare that from, from day to day to see if that's improving. The other things that we sometimes use would be things like V160 or V200, and that stands for the velocity at 160 beats per minute, or the velocity at 200 beats per minute. And the idea is, not that you would be using this um, at your home, but you the idea is the more fit you go, the faster a horse should be able to go. So by comparison, you take an elite endurance human, somebody who competes in marathon races, and they could probably go at the same speed as a person who's totally unfit, and the person, human, who's, heart, or who's totally unfit, their heart rate might be 180 beats per minute, and that marathon runner, their heartbeat might be 70 or 80 beats per minute. So the faster you can go at a constant heart rate, uh, that's a pretty good sign. But let's go back to an important question. Should you use a heart rate monitor? Well, there's a lot of folks that like to use them, but between you and me, if you have a lot of experience with horses, 
and you're pretty attentive to them and you can read the signals, it's probably not critical that you use one. Um, I use one a lot for research purposes. Uh, I don't know if I've ever used one personally for training. So if you have a person on horseback that can uh, can read your horse, I think that's going to provide you a lot of clues. Now, if you're new to the game, and there's nothing wrong with that, to be honest, we've all have to start at some point. Um, you know, it allows you to get a feel for your, the way your horse is responding. I, and so, for instance, if you go ahead and have a heart rate monitor on your horse and you're noticing the heart rate going up, you might at the same time be noticing some changes in that horse's attitude. And that heart rate monitor can give you a signal that you might be able to find useful so that later on it's not critical that you use a heart rate monitor, but instead you can just read the signs that your horse is giving you. I want to tell you about another fun thing that uh, is sometimes used incorrectly, um, and that's the hematocrit, which is the pack cell volume. In the blood, you have red blood cells, and the primary function of red blood cells is to carry oxygen. And uh, the thing about those is one way to improve performance is to increase the amount of red blood cells in your body. Um, you know, we got a pan picture of Lance Armstrong, phenomenal athlete, uh, but he, you know, brings about the whole issue of cycling, bike racing, and the problems that they had. And there has been a lot of controversy over the past few years about humans that were blood doping themselves. When you blood dope, there's two ways to do it. One is you take a drug, it's EPO, erythropoietin, and what that does is it stimulates the amount of red blood cells that are being produced. People do that with horses. And sometimes those horses uh, go into shock, they have a reactions to it, and they die. Certainly don't recommend doing it if for no other reason other than that. Um, give you another reason why you don't want to do it in a few seconds. But the other way that you can do it is you can go ahead, or human athletes will do this sometimes, which is to take a blood, uh, you know, they donate blood, they spin off the red blood cells, they throw them in a freezer, they store them, and the body regenerates those blood cells. And so then, shortly before competition, you put the ones that you stored in your freezer and you infuse them back into yourself. So suddenly you have a whole lot more red blood cells and you can perform at a higher level. By no means am I indicating that uh, Lance Armstrong done, has done that, but there are definitely a lot of athletes that have done it and a lot of them have also gotten busted for it. So the interesting thing with humans is normally resting hematocrit values, the amount of red blood cells uh, present, are about the same at rest or during exercise. So you won't see much change unless a person has uh, blood doped and added more. Then you might see some higher hematocrits. The interesting thing with horses is their resting hematocrit is substantially lower than their exercising. Horses have a spleen that stores red blood cells. And so, at a time when they get scared, ah, cougar jumps on the back, things like that. You know, right as that horse is getting ready to take off, the, the spleen contracts, the red blood cells are dumped into the bloodstream, and the horse uh, has a much greater capacity to carry oxygen. That's wonderful. It makes them one of the reasons why they're a phenomenal athlete. Now, I tell you this because, well, first of all, people have tried blood doping with horses. That's dumb. Again, horses do it to themselves. They are so much better than us. The other thing that I'm going to tell you is sometimes people take blood samples on their horse and they'll look at the hematocrit and they'll be, oh, it's low. And then they'll train the horse and they'll see that it's higher. Or they'll put it on some foo-foo supplement and it creates a higher hematocrit, or so they believe. The problem with it is, as I've mentioned to you, it's not just exercise that creates um, the splenic contraction, but it's horses being startled or anything like that. So looking at the hematocrit, the amount of red blood cells uh, in a sample probably don't tell you all that much. So it's one of those things that people will try to use as an indicator, but it's probably a poor one. Another thing that is often monitored is respiration. Okay, so monitoring respiration after exercise. Sounds like a great idea. But, I can tell you, I have ridden horses equally hard, and sometimes they're breathing um, relatively slow, sometimes they're breathing extremely fast, and these horses, same fitness, work the same intensity.
What's the difference? Well, some of those horses that have gone ahead and have uh, had very high respiration rates, well, I spent five and a half years in Texas. You know, if you're riding horses in Houston, Texas on a hot summer day, it doesn't matter how hard you're working them. Um, then um, one of the things that's happening is uh, the horse is breathing hard in order to try and cool itself off. So as a result, that might be part of the, uh, the situation. By comparison, uh, you know, I've ridden horses in Minnesota, galloped them in blizzards, and those horses, when you finish riding them, they still might have a better, uh, or they might have the same need for oxygen, but they're cooler, so they don't have that demand for cooling themselves off. So, again, it's one of those things that can fool you just a little bit. Another really interesting thing about horses that it's important to become aware of is that while horses are loping, you know, that when they're cantering, when they're galloping, they actually couple their strides to their breathing rate. As a result, for every breath that horse is taking in, or I should say for every stride that horse is taking, um, they're taking a breath. So you really can't tell anything about the horse's respiration rate while they're loping, cantering, um, or, or running all out. It's going to be the same as however many strides they take. So if you're trying to count the breaths while they're loping, first of all, that's a pretty impressive task to do, but it's not going to tell you much other than how many strides they're taking. And trust me, the strides are a whole lot easier to count. Okay, <clears throat> we talked a little bit earlier on regarding muscle in that horses developed for sprinting. You know, if you think about it, they originally developed the plains of North America, and sometimes they just needed to get away from predators in a hurry. And as a result, they developed muscles that were very well adapted for that. There's a couple of different muscle fiber types that we typically talk about, the slow twitch muscle fibers and the fast twitch muscle fibers. The slow twitch fibers, they're very slow to fatigue, so they're fatigue resistant and they work really good at going ahead and allowing an animal to carry on endurance type of activities. And the fast twitch fibers, they fatigue really fast, but they go ahead and allow an animal to perform uh, speed events and they have a lot of... Uh, a lot of power. Now the horse does have a lot of that, but these muscle fiber types are very dependent on genetics. When you have an Arabian born versus a quarter horse halter horse, at birth you see a major difference. And viva la difference. If you think about endurance horses, they excel at endurance type of activities. And if you go ahead and take one in a show ring, it's going to have a whole lot more ability to sustain its level of activity for a longer period of time. You compare that to the, the quarter horse that if you even just look at the muscling, there's a lot of definition to it or a lot of mass to it. And um, again, this deals a lot with genetics and you can't change that part very much, but to some degree there is training changes that that can occur. So if you go ahead and you know put a horse into race training, you're going to see some differences if you put them into show training. But a lot of the training that we deal with, as I mentioned earlier, focuses more on developing endurance. And very little of it depends on developing speed for our animals or strength. Um, you know, your, your horse even like if you're uh, training them to go over uh, jumps, that it requires some uh, 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 some strength, you're probably not going to gain a whole lot more than what that horse would have actually had just based upon its genetics. I'm trying to switch here to the next slide. Hey, there we go. Some interesting uh, trivia here, just regarding the muscle fiber composition comparing horses to humans. As you will recall, the type 2 muscle fiber types tend to be the type of muscle fibers that give you speed, give you strength. 
In human sprinters, the ones that are going 100 meters, you have about 75% uh, of their muscles are type 2. With horses, the sprinters, about 80% uh, of the sprinting type animals, or about 80% uh, of the muscle fibers are type 2 and are sprinters. So very, very similar. What's fun is to compare that to our endurance type athletes. With our humans, our endurance athletes, the marathon performers, they have about uh, 75% type 1 fibers, meaning only 25% type 2. So again, they have totally uh, adapted themselves to performing endurance type of activities. By comparison, if you look at horses, they only have about 30% type 1, meaning that they have about 70% type 2 fibers. So it's not a huge difference from our sprinting horses. Now granted, the studies that have looked at this, I don't think they did it uh, in the ideal system because I don't believe they used Arabians. And again, in my opinion, Arabians are your ideal endurance uh, horse. And so that might give you a little bit different scenario. But as a whole, it does show that horses have a whole lot more of the sprinting type muscle fibers, but any of the changes that we're going to see are going to go ahead and try and shift that horse to a, a type 1 fiber, one that's going to give it more endurance. And that's what you really need for a lot of our show type animals. Uh, you need to be able to give these animals some ability to handle being warmed up, to compete in the show ring, and to come back you know, a number of times potentially throughout the day. There's another thing that most people don't realize. Skeletal system is actually a very dynamic system. Uh, we think of bone, most people think of bone as just a bunch of mineral, a bunch of calcium, a little bit of phosphorus, and it doesn't change at all. You couldn't be further from the truth. Yes, there's that mineral, there's also a protein matrix, but what's really important to realize is that the skeletal system is continually changing. You're continually replacing damaged bone or old bone with new bone. And one of the sad things to realize is that if you don't use your skeletal system, you're going to lose a lot of that mineral. And as a result, you have the potential to create horses that have weak skeletal systems. And in fact, a lot of the things that we do with our horses does not promote skeletal strength at all. When I first moved to Michigan State University, um, we did a study because one of the things that I thought might be impacting skeletal strength is whether or not we stick horses in the pasture. And so we conducted a study where we had a, a group of, of uh, two-year-old Arabian horses that uh, had been previously raised out on pasture. We randomly took half of them, uh, put them in stalls, kept the other half out on pasture, and we took radiographs or x-rays of their cannon bones and we looked at what happened to the mineral content. That's what these uh, RBAE stands for. It's radiographic bone alumina equivalents. But just look at these lines, these yellow lines and blue lines as indicating the mineral content of the cannon bone. And what you'll notice is that the horses in yellow out on pasture, you know, these were growing horses and they just saw a gradual increase. But by contrast, the horses that we had put in stalls, and an interesting thing is they weren't in stalls with no exercise. We actually walked them for an hour a day on a mechanical walker. But those horses that we put in the stalls had a huge decrease by the next time we took a, uh, an x-ray. So one month later, they had already lost a lot of the mineral. By day 84 of the study, uh, I had a grad student who wanted to learn how to uh, start young horses under saddle, and since I do a lot of that, it was like, okay, let's take this whole bunch of horses and, and, and put them into training. And that's what we did. And, and for those first 60 days, which on that graph is days 84 to 140, we walked, trot, loped these horses. And what's really kind of startling is the fact that 140 days after we put these horses into that study, 140 days after the group of stalled horses had gotten put in stalls, about 60 days after they had been put, in, put into training, the mineral content of the cannon bone was lower than we ever started. Whereas those horses out on pasture, not an issue. So 
It's another little bit of a concern that you need to keep in mind when you're putting horses in the stalls, when you're not allowing them to do any kind of sprint exercise. If you don't do any type of sprint exercise, and that can just be allowing them to run on their own, you're probably going to uh, produce a weakened skeleton. So the question is, is this a big deal? Well, what are you doing with your horse? I have yet to see a Western Pleasure horse break a leg off in the ring. Okay, so those type of horses, it's probably not an issue. Now, if you're going with a jumper, an eventing horse, uh, where they're actually going to be putting some pretty serious stress on the legs, absolutely you need to be concerned. And you would think that by putting a horse into training and doing walk, trot, slow lope, medium canter, that that would be rigorous enough exercise to, to maintain skeletal strength. It really isn't. It's the fact that a horse needs to be able to sprint. And it doesn't have to be much sprint. Um, you know, we've done the studies here where, you know, probably 50 to 100 yards, you know, once per day, that's probably enough. Typically, if you have a horse that you turn them out, once per day, they're going to probably do that on their own. And truthfully, you're probably going to ward off any problems with weakened skeleton just by doing that. But there's a lot of horses out there that don't get that kind of turnout. Um, and how much turnout time you're saying, do I need to leave them an hour, an hour, a two hours, three hours? Realistically, however long it takes a horse to run 50 yards, 100 yards. So probably 10 seconds of turnout is adequate to prevent skeletal strength losses as long as that horse does some running. Now, try and catch your horse after 10 seconds. Good luck. Um, and at the same point, there's so many other benefits from turnout that I'm not advocating you only need to turn it out just a few seconds, but to prevent skeletal problems, that's the case. A lot of other good reasons to have turnout. And that goes back to the mental thing. But another area that <clears throat> is really important to deal with is cartilage damage. And we see a lot of horses. It amazes me how many horses are getting their joints injected. Horses that have not had any rigorous training at all. Uh, and, and the question is, is why? Well, I'm going to give you some thoughts on that. And this is kind of backed up with some studies that have been done recently. Uh, a lot of people lunge their horses. Okay, it's a regular part of a lot of people's training protocol, but I guarantee you it is very hard on the legs. If you're going to lunge a horse, here are some things that you need to keep in mind. One, the larger the circle, the better off you're going to be. The smaller the circle and the faster the circle the more damage you're doing. Um, the one study that was done, actually was done in lambs, because they actually wanted to look at the joint damage, and, and they used lambs, baby sheep, uh, in a round pen situation where they exercised them continuously. Um, it was amazing the amount of damage that was done to the joint. So, you know, again, I'm not telling people not to lunge horses. I recognize it's part of their program, but if you do it, again, large circles and slow circles. The faster you go, the smaller the circle, the more damage that you are doing. And I really suspect this is one of the major problems or one of the major reasons why we're having a lot of cartilage damages. Uh, lunging is a popular thing by a lot of folks. Okay, well, moving on, let's talk about um, some other things that you really need to consider. And that's like flexion training, sports-specific training, things that are going to help develop skills and coordination for your horses. As for flexion training, I can't emphasize enough the important thing that I love to have horses flexible. You know, my background, again, is, deals with a lot of racing. I don't like stiff horses. I think they should be able to flex. You want to have some bend to them. That's just going to be an animal that you're going to be able to guide better. It's going to be a horse that's more comfortable. It's relaxed. It's going to perform better. So I use that as an example of if I firmly believe it's important for race horses, it really is important for every type of show horse. And the other thing about it is I love horses being soft and supple. You know, we can force horses to bend. You can tie them around and crank them. But that's not making for a happy horse. If you really want to do it right, you're going ahead and you're 
asking them to give. You want to be able to have that horse accepting you out of its eyes, being comfortable with that, and you don't get that by forcing them to bend. So again, can't emphasize it's enough. Take some time, get some softness. Um, and if people are encouraging you uh, to tie them around, I'm not saying that's something that should never be done. Absolutely, there's times and places, but so much more can be done with your hands and asking the horse to give and you giving back when the horse gives t to you. Now, sports specific training, absolutely. Um, you're never going to have a polo horse be able to compete unless you'd actually or and do well if you never you know go ahead and swing a mallet on it same thing with roping you know any type of uh, activity you do you're going to have to do it somewhat to get that horse used to it at the same point you can overdo it if you do too much of that type of activity for instance barrel horses rarely do you ever see uh, a very high competitor go out there and daily run um, a barrel pattern many, many, many times in a day. What you might have them do is you might have them walk and trot that, um, uh, that go ahead, uh, you walk and trot the pattern a lot of times so that that horse realizes what it needs to be done. So again, you have to do some sport specific training. You need to do a fair bit of it. Make sure you don't overdo it. Um, actually, I want to comment on a question that was buzzed right there regarding thoroughbreds implementing the, the uh, changes. You know what, we're actually seeing a lot of it regarding turnout, um, but it's limited from the standpoint of uh, if you're at a racetrack, there's 2,000 horses at the place, uh, they don't have that ability. However, when uh, thoroughbred trainers have horses at uh, their home facilities, you see some of them that are kind of catching on to the idea that turnout is a, a really good thing. As for the flexibility training, part of the problem that you deal with is the people that ride the horses. Um, a lot of these are exercise riders. Their job is to get on, get off, get on to the next horse, and that's not ideal. Um, so as a result, uh, you know, it's a yes and no type of answer. Um, Oh, and good point regarding the thoroughbred trainers, whether it's for racing or eventing. You know, I'm going to guess for eventing, folks, that certainly would be the case. Um, the other thing I want you to do is you need to pay attention to what the individual is. Okay. Do you got an elite animal or do you have one that is not quite so elite? Um, yeah, you know, the other thing I've done, yes, I have trained the world's fastest cow under saddle. Uh, Eight minutes and 55.4 seconds to uh, uh, for the mile. Now the deal is, is if there was a regular horse, <laughs> that would be horrible for a cow that was pretty darn fast. And the deal was, is I wasn't going to ask her to go any faster. She can't. She she did awesome for what she was asked to do. For any of our animals, you can't expect them to perform above what their level is. And when you try to do that that's when we kind of create some issues for our horses. Um, asking an unathletic animal to, to perform in a frame that it can't, usually what we end up doing is trying to force that animal to do it. And, and again, you know, the sad part about it, it's not fun for the horse and it's not fun for the trainers. And it's sad when you see trainers that at one point loved horses that do things to them that you say, how can you do that if you like this animal? And, and I see that a fair bit. And, and sometimes I think it's because they're forced to try and make horses compete at a level they really aren't capable of doing. So always train the individual, accept their best, and go with that. And along with that reward for trying. Uh, for those of you out there who might be familiar with cutting horses, they actually tend to last they don't tend to have the burnout that a lot of our other horses do. And part of the reason for that is the way you develop a good cutting horse is, you know, you slowly guide them, they go ahead, they figure it out, and then you get out of their way. Once they've done things right, you, super, we do have a cutting horse a trainer out there. And yeah, once that horse has figured it out, absolutely, you get out of their way. And when we go ahead 
and keep harping on horses and never reward them for trying, that's when they're going to get burned out. But again, if you go ahead and reward them by getting out of their way, stopping what you're doing and rewarding them, that will make a happy horse. And at the same point, allow periods of rest. You know, I used to uh, train reining horses before I got into uh, to the whole racing thing. And that's how you put a great stop on these horses is when they do it correctly, you stop and you let them stand there. They begin to hunt out that stop because they want to rest. Horses are like humans. We're all lazy. And if you reward us for doing something right, and for horses, one of the easiest rewards is to let them rest and that also helps because once they're beginning to get fatigued it's one of those things that they aren't going to be able to perform well and yeah you're going to end on a bad note and you really do as being pointed out there you really want to end on a positive note mention keeping things interesting um if you ride your sage find yourself some cows go work a cow on them Take your, take your race horses trail riding. I've done that many different times. Take any horse trail riding. Um, what's really sad is I've seen show horses that can't handle going out for a trail ride. I'm thinking it's a shame if you can't take a broke show horse and go out trail riding because you're afraid it's going to get spooked. You know, if we're changing things up on them a whole lot, that's going to help out a bunch. Your barrel horse, take it over some jumps. You know, the more you change things up, that's going to help your horse. And they're going to be doing so much better when they go into a strange event, a strange location. And it's one of those things that if they've been exposed to a lot of different things, something different happens and they say, okay, whatever, that's fine. They don't uh, think it's anything so strange. Um, again, I change it up, trail riding. Yeah, monsters, cows, oh my lord, um, horses. Until they've seen a lot of different things, everything's scary. And if all you do is go around in a circle, in a show ring, everything else is going to be scary for them. So, how do you know if you're headed in the right direction? Well, first things first, probably easy to tell whether you're going in the wrong direction. Decrease performance. We can overtrain horses. Um, they're... Uh, uh, a case where a horse begins to not do as good as it was doing, probably what you're doing is causing some injuries, that little bit of soreness, and and I'll get back to that uh, that sprint question, great one here, um, but you're causing some these horses uh, to develop injuries. Even if you don't detect them, you're going to notice them, and and that's a problem. The other thing that I often pose a uh, trick question to my students, which is, does lifting weights make you stronger? Think about it. Does lifting weights make you, as a human, stronger? Well, most people would say yes. In reality, I like to tell them, no, it's resting that makes you stronger. Because if lifting weights made you stronger, you could sit at a weight bench and bench 100 pounds, and then 110 pounds, and then 120 pounds, and then 130 pounds, and you could keep going. Obviously, that doesn't work. It's taking that rest that allows you to become stronger. Um, of course, having lifted some weights does help, too. So again, you could get some decreased performance because you're not giving them enough time to rest. They're, they're getting sick, they're developing injuries, and you're developing a really poor attitude, and that's something that you really need to avoid. Um, you know, and I want to address, there was a, yeah, I'll come back to that in a few seconds. I do love the question regarding the sprint training. So again, those are signs of fatigue. Those are signs you're overdoing it. And I want to give you another cautionary tale. You know, I told you you need to be organized. Well, yes, but be careful about training by the calendar. And I think a lot of the problems we create are due to the fact that we need to have our horse ready by June 15th or July 27th or May 3rd because we have a show, a race, a competition that we need to be in and it's scheduled for that day. So we force our horse to be ready for it whether or not they are and that's where we create a lot of problems. If we go ahead and take our time and what it might mean is you might have to pass on this competition that you've been planning for. 
we might have to pass on it for the horse's sake. What most people do, and this is a shame, but what a lot of people do is they'll go ahead and they'll doctor up a sore horse so the horse doesn't feel the pain, or they will do things, use contraptions on their horse and force it into whatever frame they need it um, so that they can meet that deadline. And that, in itself, is a horrible shame. At this point, I actually want to address that question regarding the sprint work and whether fast works um, are detrimental. You, you know, I'm seeing that in the thoroughbred game, uh, these two-year-olds that are going out there and doing some of these really phenomenally fast works for a furlong or so, uh, an eighth of a mile, and they're trying to you know get in under 12 seconds. I don't necessarily think that's good, uh, and, and those horses are definitely having some problems. I don't think it actually has to be bad, and in fact, sprint work is positive. The problem is, is people tending to overdo it, and also those folks that are doing those really fast works for those two-year-old and training sales, they're doing it by the calendar. And, and, and it, your, your question was a perfect tie-in on this, in that they're going ahead and they're needing these horses to run as fast as they can ever go on April 15th or whatever the date might be. And that's where the problem lies. Speed by itself is good. Um, I'm actually an advocate of training horses young. And, and there's a lot of research, and it's both in uh, tendon, it's in bone, even in cartilage, that shows that working horses while they're young is actually very beneficial to making stronger skeleton and tendon. Flies totally to the contrary of what everybody's believed. But the problem is, is people tend to overdo it, do too much of it, and oftentimes the people that do early work are the people that are trying to target having their horses ready by a, a certain date. And again, that's where you're running into problems. So again, fast while young by itself is actually good. Too much fast, especially by a given date, needing to have horses ready, that is what's really detrimental. And as bad as it is for the, the legs, I would say it's equally as bad for the mind. Though again, I love, I often have uh, start horses when they're 18 months old and I have no problem. I'm a little guy, I can do it. Um, but we also don't sit on them for, for, uh, for many hours. You know, you might start and put 15 minutes on them. Um, and, and as the ideal age to begin, in fact, we kind of timed ourselves about right there, I don't see a huge difference in breeds. Um, I know here at Michigan State University where the Arabians and when I arrived here, they thought it was horrible, the idea of breaking long yearlings. And then they saw that, oh, there's no problems. We've had two-year-olds doing endurance um, studies. Absolutely no problems, and the horses are just so well adapted. Um, so uh, again, whenever they're big enough where they can uh, uh, sustain a rider's weight, I think that's one of the things I consider. But I definitely would not put long hours on them. Uh, again, I like the idea of maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes. Start out slowly. They're kids. It's like in kindergarten. Um, you need some rhesus, and if you work those little kindergartens too hard, um, they're going to get tired, they're going to get fed up, and, and they're not going to enjoy it, and they're going to get burned out. So again, I, I don't know if there's an ideal age. I'm all for younger, and I don't think it's as necessary for breeds. Um, you know, some people say warm bloods and everything else. Um, you need to start them later. Actually, there's no real good reason to do it. You can actually see a lot of benefits, and we could get into the research showing that younger is probably better. Just don't overdo it. And, and the final point on this deal is signs of success. You know. Obviously, you want to be successful in the show ring. Most people, you go into it not hoping to be the bottom of the class. You want to have some success. But more importantly, when the day's done, you want to be happy with yourself. I, I'm speaking for myself. You know, winning is great. I really, I care about my animals, and I, and I want to see them actually be happy also. And so if you can look at yourself at the end of the day, and, and you know that your horse is content, you're content, I, I think you probably accomplished a lot more than a lot of the trainers that are out there these days. So with that, I see we are just out of time. Uh, I want to thank you all for, uh, for being with us, uh, and hopefully you can join us some more um, at these My Horse University programs. Okay, have a great one.
Thank you so much, Dr. Nielsen, for um, being with us tonight. Right. And if all of you, um, if you have any feedback or questions, please email info at myhorseuniversity.com. Also, I mentioned that we just launched a short course series, which you can also find more information out at www.myhorseuniversity.com. And our phone number is there as well. I hope you all had a great time during the presentation, and you all have a wonderful night, and we see you back again um, at another